Coming up on the Louis Diaz podcast. I think it's just the more you put yourself out there in the world, the more you open yourself up to the good and the bad and the interesting. So there were so many highlights and moments of awe that with that comes these, you know, crazy dumbfounded moments as well. Hello and welcome to the Louis Diaz podcast. Every day I come across some of the most incredibly fascinating and authentic people from all walks of life. And together, we're inviting you in to be our special guest as we take you through some of their amazing experiences, adventures, and journeys. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Louis Diaz Podcast. Okay, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Louis Diaz Podcast. Today, I've got a really special guest, a fellow podcaster, as a matter of fact, Steph Page with me. Welcome, Steph. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Where are we going today? You wrote a one-liner. I did. Tell yeah. us about it. I did. So the liner that I came up with for today is, today we're going around the world where what should inspire us seems mundane and what should scare us will enlighten us. Okay. When people write those one-liners, mm -hmm. I'm usually either like I completely just get what they're trying to say and sometimes I'm just really intrigued. Actually, most of the time I'm really intrigued because <laughs> they seem a little bit cryptic in a way. Yeah. But... Um, this isn't our first recording. I think I should tell the audience. <laughs> this is take number two. Yeah, take two. Yeah. Take we, two. We had a, like a amateurish kind of blunder the first time around where um, firstly my equipment didn't work and then you helped me with your equipment. Yeah. And then it just like stopped recording. I think my computer went into sleep mode. Yeah. And so, yeah, so we lost a couple moments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, actually, when I played it back, it was like the best part of the story <laughs> was gone. And I don't want to give anything away by sort of revealing what that is because mm -hmm. we're, we're going to get to that, right? Yes. Um, but, yeah, it was just pretty uh, a pretty daunting moment when I realized that I had lost a recording. And um, now we're faced with the first time ever I have to re-record Mm -hmm. And I just want to say a huge thank you to you for being a guest on the Louis Diaz podcast. Um, it really is such a privilege to have someone who not only has such a great story to share with us, uh, an intriguing story, that's for sure, <laughs> um, but a fellow podcaster. Mm -hmm. but before we get stuck in, do yeah. you want to tell the audience what the name of your podcast is? Sure. Yeah. So a girlfriend of mine and I, we have a podcast called All the Shit I've Learned Abroad. So it is a travel podcast and we've been doing it. At the time of recording, we're almost 40 episodes in right now, and uh, it did really well in 2019. So I'm really excited to see what 2020 will bring for that. Yeah, um, we were talking a little bit off air, and uh, you guys were talking about your strategy for 2020. Mm -hmm. um, how did, just out of interest, and, and for people out there who love podcasts and want to think about getting into their own podcast, you know, I know from my experience, it, it does take a bit of work. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. And you've got a partner. Does it take a lot of work and planning? Well, it's funny because we launched in April of 2019 and I got a Facebook memory just the other day where, you know, I had taken a photo of our little podcast recording and we were on Skype so you could see her on my computer and the photo was from January 2018. So we actually started recording with an idea and we did tons of episodes and then we edited them and then we listened back and we tried to record the next one and we realized we didn't have an idea that would be sustainable. So we had to scrap everything we'd done, start from scratch, get a new idea or a new concept and rebuild. So we started in January 2018 and it took till April 2019 to launch. So it's definitely a process and a learning curve for sure. Yeah, great. And as was your adventure that we're just about to talk about uh, and 40 episodes or more in now and... Uh, yeah, you've got some pretty great content. So oh, thank you. Um, I recommend everyone check out um, all the shit I've learned abroad. Yes. Isn't that right? I want yeah. to say it right, especially <laughs> the, you know, the curse word. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it, it's actually full of really great content, especially if you're, you know, someone that hasn't traveled much or if you're, if you are an experienced traveler, but there's somewhere that you haven't been before mm -hmm. um, that you're kind of intrigued about, you girls have pretty much been almost everywhere. Oh, no, not quite, but I, I wish it one day. It feels like that though when I listen to you guys. You've got such a wealth of knowledge that oh, you, um, you impart on, on your listeners. And um, But tell us, where are you taking us today? 
So today we are going back to 2015, which is kind of when everything changed for me. Or you might have to edit this out. Did we start in 2010 when it started, the volcano? Uh, I'm not sure, but okay. we can. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to 2010 today. I'll give you an intro to what inspired me. Yep. And then we're going to flash forward to 2015. Okay, great, great. So in 2010, my girlfriend, Andrea, the one I do the podcast with, her and I were in a rut in our careers. And not a bad one. We just became comfortable. We weren't growing anymore. We weren't learning anymore. And we were very stagnant. So we were kind of talking about it. And this was a Wednesday. And we decided to book a spontaneous flight that Saturday. All great. England, Ireland, those were the two places we were going. Very safe for first-time travelers or people who've never really explored much. Those are very common places to go. Went to London, had a great time, got to Dublin, and we were in Dublin for a day when a volcano erupted in Iceland. I'm not going to say it right. It was that I don't know. I vaguely remember that in the news. <clears throat> yeah. So it shut down European airspace for days. And Dublin was actually the epicenter of it. So we were stuck there for an extra week longer than we planned to be. And that kind of changed everything for us. We were living day to day, realizing you can just go out and explore with no idea when we were coming home, what was happening. And we just had to go with it. There was nothing we could do to control that. There was no way to get home, no way to get out. And when we finally did get home, the, sky, you know, the airspace cleared, the ash cloud calmed down. We got home and it was like something had changed in us. And we were like, we got home and we knew instantly we had to go back. So we started planning then. And by November, we'd quit our jobs and moved to England. So that's what kind of started everything for us. Now, I didn't love England. Andrea really did well there. I stayed just under a year and then I was like, okay, I'm ready to go back to Canada. Um, so I did and got a job and everything and realized what was for me was I wanted to travel around the world. I didn't want to move to one place. What was calling me was constant moving. So I saved up for the next couple of years, and I, in March 2015, I quit my job to travel the world. So that's where we're flash-forwarding so now. So that's where we're flashing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, you know, just when you were talking there, it, it sounds like um, maybe you guys went to the UK and Ireland with you know, an itinerary and then the volcano kind of disrupted the end of that trip mm -hmm. and uh, it, it caused you to have to now suddenly be a bit more spontaneous yes. about the way you did things. Sp uh, spontaneous and adaptable because, you know, life throws curveballs at you that you could never see coming and a volcano certainly qualifies as one of those. Mm. Um, so you just have to adapt to your situation and make the best of it. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and and that's kind of spurred you on in this way, right? Like in a new way that you hadn't expected from that trip. Definitely. It was like a light switch had been flicked on with, you know, wanting to see the world and wanting to explore more and just wanting that feeling more often of just being free and taking it day by day. Yeah, I'm probably just about to say something that no one's ever said, but thank God for that volcano, right? <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah, no, I agree. I say it all the time, but um, that was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Mm. Yeah, just having sort of come from pretty intense summer here in, in Australia, yeah, it, it's sort of speaking more to me now than ever that, you know, life's short and that plans can change and life can change really, really quickly and mm -hmm. it, because of Mother Nature. Yeah, that's why it, sometimes I think humans – we get very mother nature likes to humble us and put us back into our place. Yeah. yeah. Or Absolutely. take us to a new place for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Entirely new place. Yeah. Um, so fast forwarded to 2015. Mm -hmm. So where are we now? So I was working near my hometown for a number of years, saving up. I put in my notice and I bought an around the world flight ticket. So I flew to South America and I spent a couple months in Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. And then we flew over to South Africa for our African portion of the trip. Spent time in South Africa, Tanzania, and Egypt. Those were the three uh, African countries that we hit. Okay. I think for uh, other people I've interviewed, the that giving notice bit 
and yeah. uh, like just the bit before they're about to give notice. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of hesitation and doubt that creeps into their minds during that period. Was it like that for you? So even though I left in 2015, it was in 2013 that the seed was really planted in my head that I had to do this. And it was actually a song and it was called, do you remember a song called Wake Me Up by Avicii? Yeah, I yeah. remember it. Huge banger. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a line in that song that goes, I hope I get to the chance to travel the world, but I don't have any plans. And for some reason, hearing that song on the radio all the time and hearing that line just was constantly, it was like, it was speaking to me, like, you need to make plans. You need to make plans. Uh, so it really inspired me. So what I started doing was I started saving like crazy. Then I started telling a few people because when you start telling people, or at least for me, it becomes real. I have to follow through. I can't be that person who talks about things and doesn't do it. That's just embarrassing. (laughs) So once I started telling people, it really became real. And I think it was about six, seven, eight months before I left that I actually bought the round world, the world ticket. So when I had that, so it was about $6,000 for that. That was real then. It was happening. There was no backing out. But yeah, I wasn't nervous. I I just remember the day I was leaving, I had an evening flight out. I just remember that whole day having this feeling of, you know, one day this is just going to be something I did. Like it was such a monumental day in the moment. And it's true. I always remember that feeling. I look back and I'm like, we've hit that day. Like it is just something I did now. But, um, but I was just always really excited. Like I was getting anxious to go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I speak to different people that are in different phases of their life and, and some people have careers that they really love mm-hmm. and some people are, you know, you know, are just in jobs to save up so, to go traveling or are a little bit unsure that they want uh, what they want to do with their lives so they think traveling is a great idea. Mm-hmm. Were you in a career that you really loved or was it not the case? No, I was. So I was a project manager at a pretty big Canadian company and I had it really good. It was a great company. I worked with great people. I, they kind of had me in this program too where I got to work in all kinds of different departments. So they weren't just training me in one area. Um, I was kind of getting the holistic. I got to work with every department. And there was hundreds of people in this company. So I was really well paid, great job. And people were telling me I was crazy to leave it. Um, but it worked out. Yeah people can think that you're crazy to, to leave <laughs> a role that seems like a dream role that anyone would sort of um, love to be in. Um, but I guess after listening to Avicii a few times, <laughs> you're pretty sure that you were going to take off. Sometimes I'm one of those people that I'm very dead set when my gut is telling me that something is the right thing to do, I'm all in. I don't second guess myself. I don't listen to the people around me. If I know it's the right thing, I know. So that was kind of what I had with that decision there. Yeah, and what a fantastic way to live. Mm-hmm. Um, now, so you, I guess we did go past South America a little bit. Okay. Was there anything about your time in South America um, that, I guess, apart from the mugging experience, mm-hmm. that made it you made it feel real? Made you feel really glad that you had taken it? Yes. Yeah. So, so leading up to the event. I had set my screensaver at work, everything, to a picture of Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. It was something I'd never seen before, and I just had this image of it in my mind that the moment I'd see it would be so beautiful, which is kind of dangerous because sometimes when you do that, you it's a bit disappointing once you actually get there. Um, but when we got there, I'd been in Brazil for about a week, and I remember... It was the evening I arrived in across the water from Rio de Janeiro is an island called Niteroi. So I was in Niteroi and we went just down to the beach and we kind of walked into the water with the water up to our knees. And I didn't realize it was there and I could see it in the distance way up massively. Um, It was Christ the Redeemer. It was dusk. So he was lit up um, just with that huge, his arms spread out looking over all of Rio de Janeiro. And it was a really powerful moment. Like it was that moment of, wow, I'm actually here. And I had the feeling I wanted to have when I saw it. So it was really nice because I think if we'd, if I'd gone up and climbed up top and saw it first, I mean, it would have been amazing regardless, but just that moment of not realizing it was there and looking up and seeing them looking down was, uh, I just got full body chills when I, uh, 
when I was there. Mm. Yeah. And early on, on in the trip, were you sort of missing home at all or, you know, still in contact? Um, yeah, I mean, I was in contact all the time. And even when I was home for those years from 2011 to 2014, I was traveling a couple times a year. So everyone was used to me being gone. Um, I didn't really get homesick the whole trip, to be honest. Like, I just loved out there, being out there and exploring and moving. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So you've taken your first stop in South America mm-hmm. and then you moved over to Africa. Yeah. There was something happened in Africa last time we spoke. I yeah. can't remember what it was. <laughs> well, it was. So we went to Egypt and by the time we got to Egypt, it is now... Um, I can't remember if it was June or July now. (laughs) We got to Egypt a few months later and everyone kept saying, don't go to Egypt. Egypt's not safe. Obviously, they've been having the uprisings. They're recovering. And even the Canadian government advisory said, avoid all non-essential travel. And I just thought, you know, I'm on this trip. It's now or never. I'm going to do it. So I went there. My girlfriend again, Andrea, flew over to meet me there from London and she landed at about two in the morning and at about six in the morning we woke up to the building kind of shaking and coming down on us and sure enough she sent me a text and she said Steph if that was ISIS I'm going to kill you and we walked out and no one really seemed concerned like the guy who worked in the building was still just working and we thought okay maybe this is normal I don't know so we went back to sleep and we woke up at eight in the morning and um Sure enough, CNN had sent a breaking news alert. Just down the road from us, ISIS had actually set off a car bomb and blown up the Italian consulate. So that's what it was. It was the bomb that had gone off was shaking our building, which is why debris from the ceilings and everything were coming down on us. So we did wake up to ISIS blowing up a building, which I guess is why the travel advisory was on high there. But um, no, it was really interesting to be on the ground and to see it all firsthand and to understand how the media portrays it versus what it's actually like there. Um, So that was a really interesting learning experience for us. And of course, so many people said, get out of Egypt now, Um, you know, be safe. And at that point, we kind of thought, well, what are the odds it's going to happen again? Mm. So we stayed. Um, But yeah, that was, I think, one of the most memorable moments of the trip, Mm. for sure. How does that kind of experience which is again like i guess like the volcano is really like out of left field yeah um how does an experience like that change your i guess uh, perception of of travel the perception that you had of your trip that you'd been looking forward to so much uh, your perception of um, a local place even yeah i think it just gave us a greater understanding that you know in the news we when we hear about bombs in the middle east you think that's always what it is or that the people live in fear. People are afraid to go out. And you realize very quickly that everybody just went about their day. And we talked to the hostel worker and he said, it's not a thing that really happens often here. Mm. And for some reason that really made us feel better. We're like, okay. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. It doesn't happen often. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Thank goodness. He actually made a joke when we said, we said to him, we're like, should we actually, you know, leave? And he's like, no, 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 that was a one off. It's not bombing season right now. That's what he said. And he said it was such a straight face. And we were like, well, all right, then. It's a very dry sense of humor. (laughs) Very. But I guess, um, you know, in times of tough times and times of tragedy and things like that, people rely on whatever mechanisms they they can to help get through them. And sometimes, you know, it is humor. Well, and I don't think anyone seemed too – well, I don't want to say no one was concerned about it. Obviously, people were. But they actually explained to us that there's a bombing scale – that they operate on. And so I was there during Ramadan, which means people are asleep during the day while it's hot and they're out in the evenings while it's cooler. So the time of day, the bomb went off at about 6, 6.30 in the morning when no one was out on the streets. Everyone had gone home to go to bed. Um, so it was a message bomb. The, the point, they weren't going for casualties. They were going to send a message. Right. So they were explaining to us how there's a scale of things. So when a message bomb goes off, people don't worry too much. That was, yeah, how it was explained to us. Okay. 
Wow. Yeah. 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 Amazing. <laughs> and Egypt, how far into the, the journey are we? So Egypt was, I want to say, four months in. Mm -hmm. And then, so we stayed in Egypt. And it's funny because when we wa actually went to leave in Egypt, we were supposed to fly from Cairo to Mumbai. And our flight was canceled because of the terror alert. So we actually had to stay in Egypt longer, um, which turned out to be a blessing because we went down to Luxor and got to see a whole other part of Egypt we originally weren't going to see. Um, so yeah, so then I went to India for a month and that was an experience as well, traveling there by myself. And all the things people tell you about traveling there as a woman and realizing they were a bit off base as well. Um, yeah, so Egypt was wonderful very, very humbling seeing the amount of poverty there. Um, you'll see people speak about poverty there, but you really can't understand it. Like if you're applying Western ideals of poverty to India, you have no idea. It's, we have poverty here and it's nothing like what it is there. It's awful there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And we heard a little bit about India when we spoke to, well, I guess when I spoke to um, <laughs> Gabby Lamb, uh, from a previous episode and yeah she recounts a really similar kind of story uh, where she talks about like the extremes she called it a place mm -hmm. of real extremes yeah definitely. what kind of um, things really stand out to you um i just remember we met a bunch of indian people there who were just so lovely and wonderful and they wanted to take us out for an evening there was a whole group of us from the hostel and we were all solo travelers so we met them we're like great let's all go out together as a big group and they took us to a nightclub and it was very fun. It was very similar to what you'd see in North America or Australia, just your typical nightclub. And then getting dropped off at the end of the night and having to physically step over humans sleeping on the sidewalk um, to get back into where you were staying. So, you know, you're out, you're enjoying, you're spending money, you're drinking, and then you're stepping over people as if they're not there, as if they're not human. And it was heartbreaking. And these weren't people even who were all, well, they were homeless, presumably. But they all seemed employed. And they were sleeping in suits and using their suit jackets to as a pillow. And then getting up in the morning and dusting themselves off and going to work. So it was just an awful experience. Like, you had to step over them to get physically. There's so many people sleeping in the streets to get into where you were staying. But it's gut wrenching just the thought of stepping over a person. Yeah. Without being able to help. Yeah. 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 It's and it's daunting. Mm. Like you just you want to help and you there's just there's nothing you can do. Like it, there's so many issues that need to be addressed there. Mm. Yeah. I mean, at this point of your trip, you've experienced quite a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think last time we spoke, you spoke about uh, something that happened in South Africa as well. I think there was maybe an Ebola uh, breakout or something like that. Oh, uh, so I was actually in Africa when the Ebola crisis was at its peak. And the Ebola crisis was in West Africa. So we were fine. Um, but what we found, it was just very interesting because when we flew from, or when I flew from South Africa to Tanzania, had I flown into Tanzania from North America, I wouldn't have had to go through any screening. But since I was flying within Africa, I had to go into this screening area and they were, you know, checking everyone's body temperatures and all this additional screening you don't typically get. But they were checking to make sure Ebola wasn't getting into the country that people who may potentially be infected were going into quarantine. Mm. Um, so that was very interesting to uh, to just experience i mm. guess yeah yeah it, it sounds like you know just in the four sort of places that you've covered apart from you know the really great experience where you realize that your dream has finally come to reality yeah. in, in <laughs> Rio, um that you'd experienced a few things that you hadn't really bargained for on this around the world trip um how are you feeling at this point i mean is this did you feel like no this is real travel or did you think you know, wow, this has really caught me by surprise. <laughs> it's funny because I think when you say real travel, it's such a subjective thing. I think I certainly saw a lot of things we take for granted, whether it's the ease of travel, the safety of wherever you may be. Uh, we take things for granted. But at the same time, I remember going out for lunch in Tanzania and there was another traveler there 
who was spending six months just traveling Africa. And he made a comment joking like, oh, well, you know, I didn't want to be one of those people who come to Africa and just go to South Africa and Tanzania and Egypt and then go home. And that was exactly the countries I was doing. And I was like, you know what? Get stuffed. Like, <laughs> I'm o- like any kind of travel where your eyes can be opened is good travel. Um, yeah, it was good. I mean, obviously, we're talking about the moments that stand out. But almost every other moment was great and just exciting and enthralling if that's the right word like it was all really good stuff so i was loving it like Mm. i was getting what i wanted out of the trip Mm. yeah where from from india i guess so india to china and china was surprised me how much now i didn't go into rural china so i think it might have been very different but i went into the big cities and i was surprised how westernized the big cities were um and then my standout moment in china i was there for a month was i was in beijing and this was i want to say late august early september no it was august and they were doing they were having the uh 70th anniversary of the end of world war ii so they were having a big military parade And Putin was flying in for it. And Ban Ki-moon from the UN was flying in. It was a big to-do. So we knew that leading Tiananmen Square was all blocked off. And leading up to the day, they said that on that day, no one would be allowed outside. And there was a vicinity where you had to evacuate. Like military parades are invite only. Very serious affairs. And the day before the parade, the hostel I was staying at was outside of the evacuation zone. But I guess they changed their mind and they decided to expand the evacuation radius. So we were in the hostel and the Chinese police came in with their guns blazing, not like in our face, but guns out, everything saying, get out of here. Like you leave now, which was fine. I grabbed my bag and I left then. But um, but that was very humbling where, you know, it's just a reminder that you're in this beautiful country and suddenly you remember like, oh, they are not quite as free here like at all um yeah that was an interesting one and then for the day of we were told like people are not allowed outside you are putting yourself at risk of being shot if you go outside the day of the parade so I happily stayed indoors all day um yeah and then life went back to normal I guess after that but yeah that was an interesting one like you've never seen like the big to-do of a military parade um quite like that Mm. yeah yeah um really interesting and i guess um it's not really something that any of my other guests have really spoken about before Mm -hmm. having to sort of be almost um told to leave Mm -hmm. without you know was there any support to say you know actually don't walk in that direction walk (laughs) that way or get on this bus and that'll take you to a safe zone or anything like that no i think the only thing that was good was of all the people that were in the hostel, we all sort of just banded together and we did walk to the nearest train station and got on a train line and everyone was on their phones as we're walking to the station trying to figure out where to go, what stop to get off at, where we can find another hostel. Um, And we all kind of just walked together and got further out of the city. Um, But, and it was good for us. I think it was about 10 in the morning when this happened that we were still at the hostel with our luggage I felt so bad for the people who had gone out to explore for the day and could just couldn't get their stuff. They just had to wait a couple of days and suck it up. So I remember at the time just being like, oh, I'm glad I was there when it happened. But mm. yeah, so we all just banded together and went to um, the underground and got further out of the city. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no one I've spoken to to date um, and I haven't spoken to that many people yet, I guess, but <laughs> I guess no one I've spoken to today um, can recount so many really bizarre kind of eye-opening mm-hmm. experiences. Did you start to think at this point in your trip that uh, there was a reason why you were meant to go through such extreme kind of um, experiences? Um, no, to be honest, I think it's just the more you put yourself out there in the world, the more you open yourself up to the good and the bad and the interesting. So there were so many highlights and moments of awe that with that comes these, you know, 
crazy dumbfounded moments as well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's never come across at any stage that you certainly wanted to um, have a wrapped in cotton wool kind of uh, around the world experience. Mm-hmm. But yet you're, you're far, having far from that, you're experiencing some things that really are just kind of out of left field, if you will. Mm-hmm. Was it getting, were you getting over it? No, not at all. I was still loving it. I could have gone on. I, the only reason I went home at the end of the trip was because I ran out of money and I cried the day I went home. I wanted to keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, so definitely not. Um, but then after China, I went to Hong Kong and what happened is in Hong Kong on the descent into Hong Kong, my eardrum ruptured. So I was in the hospital for a few days and then I was grounded. I was deemed not fit to fly. So I was in Hong Kong for a month, just waiting to get better. So kind of living day to day there rather than playing tourist. And that got a little mundane, I guess. Another sort of experience that (laughs) doesn't come up every day, I guess, um, is that the reason that you had to go home apart from, I guess you mentioned running out of money, your eardrums? So I, yeah, I did go to Thailand for a month after Hong Kong. Um, but what happened at that point was my travel insurance, they wouldn't renew my policy. They wanted me to get home and to see a Canadian doctor and to get treated there. And they said, if I didn't go home, nothing would be covered. Mm. And I thought, oh, shit, I guess it's, uh, I got to go. So I flew home and I was sad the entire way. Mm. Yeah. It's certainly sounding like the experiences that you've had just on that one round the world trip so far mm-hmm. have really set you in good stead to have your own podcast where you can talk about all sorts <laughs> yeah. of things. Yeah. Sometimes I forget because I, as everyone does, you compare yourself to the people who do more. So I'm constantly comparing myself. Oh, well, you know, there's all these women who are younger than me who've been to every country in the world. And that's what, I think that's what people naturally do. But sometimes when you talk about it, you realize, oh no, I've I've done some stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great perspective. Um, Mm -hmm. So Hong Kong a month. Yep. Then Thailand for a month and then home. Okay. Yeah. How was Thailand? Thailand was beautiful. I was so sick of mega cities by the time I got to Thailand and I think a mega city is defined as anything over 10 million. It's just people, 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 busy, smells, constant movement. So in Thailand, I just rented a house for the month in the middle of nowhere. Didn't go to Bangkok, didn't go to Phuket, didn't go to all the you know big places. And I just lived. So I drank ginger tea. I went to sleep when the sun went down. I woke up when the sun went up. I read a lot. I exercised a lot. I just really um regrouped before going home and it was just beautiful Mm. yeah it sounds like a beautiful experience yeah and and one where you might get a a more authentic kind of feel of a country as well Mm -hmm. i think i did a bit um i mean i'm sure tons of people would love to critique me on that but i didn't do all the typical stuff there um and i remember you know just walking to a local shop and everyone only speaks thai i had no communication but you could tell, like, you could get by. I could buy the things I wanted to buy. Um, I kind of saw one day that this place was doing laundry in the back. So I carried a bag there and they were like, yep, just took it from me. So um, it's very nice to realizing how much, how you can get by without language and realizing all the ways you can communicate people that don't require you to speak the same language as well. Yeah, I, I guess it's a great opportunity to realize how hospitable other cultures are mm-hmm. um, despite not being culturally aligned. I think the one thing, and I don't know if this will be kind of wrapping it up nicely, but I think the one thing I really took home from all of this, whether it was you know, seeing the reaction in Egypt to the people in China, to Thailand, is that almost everyone in the world is just trying to live their lives. They just want to love their families as best they can, have good times with friends, you know, support themselves and the people they love. Like that's really what almost everyone in the world is striving for. And we really forget that by putting, you know, the other label on people. And we're all just really kind of doing the same thing in just different ways, different language. Um, But we're all doing the same thing. Mm, Yeah, that's really beautifully said. Um, So Thailand to home. Yeah. Did you go straight back to work when you went home? Um, I, no. <laughs> so um, I got home. I was there, I think, for a week or two. And then I went out to California for a month. 
Um, I have a girlfriend there. It's like my home away from home. So I visited her. Then I went to Vancouver for a while. And then I went home. And yeah, I thought about going back to work. Oh, well, I did get a job. I got a remote job, the one I still have now, in fact. And then since I worked remotely, I ventured off for six months around the States doing a road trip through almost every U.S. state and um, working on a project doing that and working on the road. Mm. Yeah. How was the experience of traveling around the States after traveling around all these other more, I guess, exotic types of local places? Yeah, it was good. It was very good because so I had my car, which I had parked while I was on my around the world. So it was nice to have my car back. And I look back at those six months in the States and I don't even know how I did it because I was driving a couple hours a day from place to place. I was filming a documentary. I was working my job full time. Um, I did. The one thing about the States is as much as Canadians, we love to make fun of our neighbors to the South. But the one thing I really got an understanding of is how diverse the geography and the beauty of all the different states are they're so different so it gave me i think definitely a more of an appreciation for the states than uh, especially with everything in the news that you would see now um it was a really good experience because same thing i just said about around the world most people in the states are just trying to live their lives and do their best and with the way the media is these days it's very easy to forget that as well mm. yeah it, it is really easy to look at America or the States, if you will, um, from, you know, like really negative yeah. point, given what's in the, in the media. And it's really Everything's so politicized right now. And most people aren't day to day, aren't living their lives, you know, on f- like all worked up and raged and on fire. Uh, but you would think they are from watching the news. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. What was your favorite part of that trip around the States? Oh, I don't know. It's so... I think the appreciation I got for states that you don't think about. So obviously I always have fun in New York. I always have fun in California. Texas was great. Um, But I think, well, and I should say I met my Australian partner while I was in Texas on this trip and he's the reason I'm here. So I guess that was the best part coming out of that trip around the states, I should say. Um, But states like Montana and South Dakota and these places you don't really think about um getting an appreciation for those places and the quieter lives and the more the more rural places um and that way of life Mm. yeah yeah you mentioned the documentary yeah before what's it called so it's called the america i know and the premise of it i'll give you the cole's notes is that i every single day on my trip through the states i didn't know where i was going or where i was staying so every day i had to meet someone to have a place to stay that night uh and i did it i think there was one night i slept in my car because i couldn't find a place but um yeah every night i just met the most amazing people so i filmed a lot of footage on the road i interviewed tons of these people that i met and stayed with and now it's being compiled into like a documentary mini series Mm. yeah okay at the moment as we speak yeah it's in post-production right now cool yeah yeah, well, I'll be sure to put up a link to the America I Know. Awesome. As well as the you know, Shit We Learn Abroad pod- podcast. Yeah. Is there, You seem like you've got a few projects on the go. Is there any other projects we need to keep an eye out for? <laughs> um, I do have another podcast coming out shortly. The name isn't set in stone yet, but we're thinking Salacious Stories. And it's a juicy one. So it's all the stories that people don't want to tell that they do when they travel, like the things people do that they don't tell their friends and family about. So we've got a lot of people coming. Everyone on the show, all our guests are anonymous and with a little voice change and they're telling their scandalous stories. So each ep- every episode will be, you know, a short clip, just really juicy story. And they're the ones I love, but people need to hear these stories because they're so great, but no one wants to put a name to them. Well, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So that's our that's uh, that's my other project on the go right now. Yeah, wow. It sounds like you do have so much happening. Um, and I guess, you know, when you, you come back from around the world trip as you did and then have that experience in the States, um, you know, what could you say to our listeners about how that may have changed you? I mean, did, did it change you? I think it certainly made me a more empathetic person. 
it made me more understanding of people's life situations and life circumstances. And I think anytime you can have that, no matter how you get it, you become a better person for it. I don't want to be one of those pretentious travel people who's like, travel made me such a better person. Um, I'm not that kind of person, but but it does. Any kind of new experiences and new insights will help you become a better person. Yeah. Mm. I'm like a young person in my early 20s. I've started my dream career. Mm-hmm. What what do you say to me right now? If I'm thinking about traveling or, or if I'm thinking about just working my, my butt off for the next 10 years, <laughs> what advice would you give me? I mean, I think everyone has a different calling and you know inside of you what you want to do. So I would say, you know, if someone's dream is to climb up the ladder and be a successful businessman, businesswoman, you know, and that's what feels right to them, do that. If you're doing what people like I when I was 25, I had the cookie cutter life I was supposed to. I was in a long term relationship. I bought a house at 23. I had an amazing job. All those little tick boxes people tell you you're supposed to tick and nothing felt right. I knew it wasn't for me. So just listen to what feels right for you. If you're in your 20s and you want to travel, I mean, the world is more accessible than it's ever been. Tons of people are doing it. So you know you're able to do it. It's just making that plan and setting that road roadmap of how you will do it. Mm. And yeah, like a follow-up question to that, I suppose, if someone's really stuck and they're like, well, okay, sure, that's really great advice, but I don't know where to go or what to do. Yeah, send me a message. That's what, I, <laughs> that's what I, I'll tell them. I mean, everyone's got their different reasons and sometimes... You know, they're very valid, cha- very valid challenges and sometimes they're excuses that are holding them back or excuses that make them f- feel safe from not making the jump. And what I like to do is give people that kick in the butt to make that jump because the jump is always the scariest part. Doing the thing you want to do is not the scary part. So I like kicking people into taking that jump. Yeah, I guess that's true of, you know, whether it's, starting a podcast or going overseas yeah or quitting your job or switching careers or yeah anything it's just making the decision um when you feel safe and you're going to be doing something that's not safe your your natural human instincts want to protect you to Mm. make you safe so sometimes you just got to force yourself yeah i read this quote once that said we suffer more in our minds than we do in reality yeah oh 100%. 100%. I like that. I really like you that. Can use that. I will. <laughs> we, yeah, we definitely, it's so true. Like, so many of our limitations we have set on ourselves. They're, no one else has put them on us. Mm. Um, Steph, it, it certainly has been a real pleasure uh, doing round two of this recording. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I found it just as, like, honestly, just as enthralling as round one. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really glad good. you could like make that. it this evening. Um, you know, usually I like to end things with a, like a little round of applause. I'll clap you for, for coming okay. for a second time. <laughs> um, but is there anything that you would want to leave with our listeners? Yeah, I think, I think I would just want to tell everyone that you are so much more resilient than you realize you are. And whatever it might be, it might be travel, it might be something totally different, but make that jump and you'll discover your own resilience. And that is the best feeling in the world. Mm. Yeah, it's such a, a great uh, piece of wisdom from you. Um, yeah, we, we often doubt our own resilience. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the truth is, I guess, just like in any situation, if something happens to us, we do just get back up, whether we like it or not. Well, and because you have to. That's, that's life. That's what life is. So... Yeah, beautifully said. Yeah. All right. Well, in one, two, three, I'm going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Steph. Thanks, Brad. Really looking forward to putting out this episode for everyone out there. And also, please have a look at the, the notes for this um, on Instagram and Facebook. You'll be able to find this at the Louis Diaz podcast. Um, yeah, on one, two, three. And give you a clap. All one, right. two, three. Okay. Woo! I'm clapping you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steph. Thanks. It was really good. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Louis Diaz podcast. To find out more about any of our guests and catch additional photos and content from this episode, find us on Instagram at louisdiaz.podcast.